hello and welcome back to Looney Tunes. Oh, seriously, folks, this one's going to be a little different because it's going <clears> to <throat> tie together some disparate threads. So it may not make sense now to some of you. So uh, that's understandable. It's called Fire to Propellantless, the Combustion Process and UAPs. And you'll see why I'm tying this together later. Subhead, from fire to propellantless in just 400,000 years. What a short, predictable trip it's been. A play off the Grateful Dead, the long, strange trip. And although this video may go too long and be too strange, what I'm trying to do here is explain why, no, sorry, it ties together from the caveman I don't know if this is the future man in the, a Tic Tac, but it could be, all right? So this guy here, he's explaining to the animals uh, how he came up with fire. When the, they, Half of them, no, he didn't. He saw it somewhere and stole it. Well, that's what we're going to do to fly like a Tic Tac. We're going to copy from nature. So what would set this crackpot off on this oddball disparate thread of what does combustion have to do with so-called anti-gravity? Aren't they different or aren't they the opposite? No. In fact, they're, they're basically the same. That's what I'm trying to get at and, basic, and tie it back to fire. You'll see why. What happened here is now do we want to go uh, skip ahead? Oh, all right. This was triggered by this tweet. I'm going to get right into it in a moment after I advertise my upcoming overall. I'm going to do a one-hour thing on uh, the Alien Scientist show and then repeat it for the APEC meeting. I know most of you know what that is. They're linked below. And... That's the great white whale, but I have to take some time off to throw in a few comments here and there when I get triggered by something like this, because this great white whale has taken a long time, and I've got to cut out, cut it down to an hour, you know, it's, because I can go on and on for this, but it's going to be whittled down to a couple of, uh, falsifiable claims followed by hundreds of indisputable indisputable statements a proposal for testable experiments and just a, just a few things so it's nailed down once and for all and um, it's as bulletproof as possible so I don't have to repeat myself forever anyway and, I, and, and then I'll have time for fun diversions like this and other things. But um, I am working on it. But in the meantime, I've got to blow off steam. And when I see a tweet like this from a guy like this about a thing like this that brings back old memories of how I came up with this light pumping thing just by looking at nature, just like this cave guy. Where is he? There he is. Just like this guy here. With a photon in his hand. I hope you can see that. And, uh, you know, you make something out of it. Okay? That's what we're going to do. And this question posed by a tweet that I put into a Twitter moment, conveniently linked below. Uh, anyone can look at it. You don't have to be on Twitter. It's a public thing. And you can follow the conversation and read it later. Uh, so I linked together, this guy really set me off, I mean, not his fault, he just reminded me of something, uh, you know, a thread of thought and a way to explain what I'm trying to say here, but he, uh, he put up one innocent tweet and got, I don't know, 27 re tweet response, whatever it is, but that's okay, that happens on Twitter sometimes, you set somebody off and they have to go off, and that's good, that's what it's good for. So, 
Let me introduce to you Chris Leto. Most of you know who he is. He is a retired U.S. fighter pilot and a training pilot who now uh, is interested in the UFOs and the UAPs. His information's linked below his Twitter handle, and that's linked to his YouTube channel. And what he's doing in retirement is looking into these UFOs. So you got a fighter pilot retired looking into these UFOs. He makes videos and uh, things like that. But he, so he, he had this random thought on Twitter. He put it up there and it, it set me off because it reminded me of uh, rabbit holes that I went in and out of, the uh, tie into this and all that. So, you know, who knows about propulsion besides a jet, you know, a jet guy interested in UFOs puts this up there. I got to respond to it. Now, while the iron is hot, this APEC thing is painstaking editing typos and printing out and rereading and proofreading and it's going on forever, but it, it will be done someday. In the meantime, let's go. So Chris says... In a tweet, is there any way to reverse the combustion process? Seems like turning heat and CO2 into fuel would be useful. And he's got a nice picture of a campfire, and that set me off on a string of Looney Tunes. But hopefully you'll get something out of it. You'll see some logic in what I'm saying here. Well, we'll see. Let's go. It made sense before when I practiced. It turned out okay, but it took a lot of gas out of the tank here, and I hope I can, I might have to take a few breaks while I'm recording this. Pardon me. Anyway, let's get started. So I see Chris post this, and I start to answer. I, uh, he, uh, you know, so he's asking... He wants to, you know, he wants to reload fuel, basically. If only we could repeat this combustion reaction over and over again. And we know that's, any jet pilot will tell you, or rocket scientist, that this combustion is why you get the propulsion. Uh, here with a campfire, you also get some nice heat and light, which the caveman enjoys. Where is that guy? The caveman and the birds and all those guys. This thumbnail. He doesn't know about the propulsion yet. He can feel that radiation pressure a little bit, which is what uh, blows the fuel out of the jets. And uh, but he's not there yet. But if you consider the source of who's asking, I think we can uh, make a few assumptions about it because he he knows that's what the jet fuel is. Anyway, in term, so I start answering. In terms of propulsion, the value there is in the explosive release of the relatively huge visible and infrared, which is heat, photons from much smaller molecules. All right, that's the explosion. You know, uh, if, if you take a hydrogen in there and you consider the photon coming out of there, it's about 6,000 four to six thousand times bigger all right that's why it's explosive it's in there it's coiled in there like a spring or something it blows out six thousand times bigger all right so that you know yeah it doesn't have traditional mass as we call it but you know it has that momentum it has mass it's just they call it something else because it's not matter all right, so it's going to blow out. It has force. It gives the pressure. It is explosive. It's causing the other mass to move. So, my, you know, that's the point. It's relatively huge. Continuing, their stored momentum is transferred to the surrounding mass and expands into a useful radiation pressure as well. Now, if you can, you can feel that when you get near a big fire. Um, it's, of course, uh, reacting with the air. It's not directly re reacting with your skin, although it is somewhat. 
Uh, but you know it's there. So that's, and it's, again, it's all caused from light, which includes visible and infrared and everything else under the sun. So there, as mass equivalents, TS, not CE, the photons can be seen as quickly and efficiently reducing the gravitational mass of whatever they are passing through. Because they have mass. When it's blown out of this rocket, the thing incidentally becomes lighter. Yes, it's trapped in the mass, but you can't... I mean, there's mass involved. It's, it's a rounding error in the long run because the light is the active ingredient. That's what you want to reload. Not, you know, you don't care about anything else, really. That's why a balloon floats without fuel, without losing any mass. It doesn't need to. That, it doesn't need to refuel. It's not going to come down right away like a rocket will, you know. Assuming it doesn't go out into space. I'm saying the superior model is ultimately the balloon because it is reloading, like he's talking about there. If, if a rocket could reload fuel in mid-flight, and remember the fuel is basically the trapped explosive light. If it, could, if it could keep those photons in there that are combining there and combusting, if it could just keep them in there, reload them with light, you'd have radiation pressure coming out of that thing, and that's like a balloon does, only it'd have a hell of a lot more, and it would be aimed, and it would be somewhat efficient. Well, we're going to do this with metamaterials. It's going to be uh, vastly more efficient than any rocket. All right? Here's a little gauntlet for you. So naturally, one might ask, how might we reload fuel with photons to achieve a continuous combustion? instead of constantly refueling. That's the problem. That's what he's seeing here in this firewood, which we will, you know, again, I see it in jet fuel. I see it in rocket fuel. Uh, he's on the right path. Continuing me. If photons are the active ingredient here, why not just reload the fuel and move closer to propellantless? Trying to plant that seed so he'll go down that, continue down that path and so anybody listening to this. Because I went through it myself when I came up with this. Using the same basic, uh, uh, my argument I just gave you. Um, what if you could reload the fuel, refuel the fuel? Because you're throwing a baby out with the bathwater, ultimately, that's what you're doing. You don't, if you could not do that, if you could approve upon that, as Chris is skirting around, or he's not skirting around, he's, he's breaching the subject. He's an imaginative guy, and he, uh, he's going down a path where people need to go. So I'm telling him in the next tweet, caution, that thought process might lead down the garden path through several rabbit holes. Telling, telling him and you, people, that uh, that's where you're headed and you're right. So let's read this little graphic uh, of mine here. All this stuff, you can, you can find it yourself. It's linked below uh, through the tweets. Where here, when I'm, here's me going down the rabbit hole back in 2019, I put, the, or 16, I think this went up. But it was a thought process I had back in 2012 when I'm coming up with this, thinking like, isn't this the same thing? Isn't a balloon and a rocket the same, you know, thing? Which sounds absurd, but if you go step by step, you're going to get there. Um. Uh, those are the kind. That's the kind of thing that has to be in that APEC thing. Just, just uh, statements like that because it's people didn't dig deep enough. You have to be more simple-minded, slower, 
patient, etc., then you'll come up with it. Anyway, or I'm insane, but I don't think so. Anyway, so let's look at this thing. Here we are comparing. This is, I'm trying to figure out how, how does this combustion tie into what I'm saying. What I, at the time I was calling continuous radiation pressure, which is what it is. Uh, and I'm trying to answer this for myself and figure out how do I explain this to other people in this field, frankly, far more educated than me precisely on what's going on now. How do you convince them when you're a tinfoil hat to change their mind or consider something else? So you mock them a little bit, and here I am mocking a rocket. It's old and wasteful. It's slow. It's one and done because it's just blowing out those, wasting those photons. Here they are from the Big Bang coming through here all the way down to us, the visible and the infrared, trapped in hydrogen, which is our best example. Our, I call it our fellow mass, our fellow matter. But it's the one that knows how to handle uh, light better. So we got to look at hydrogen, learn from it. What are you doing? Why are you floating around while we're stuck down here? How do you, how do you store, uh, quote unquote, combustion? How do you give us this light and heat we need? Uh, and how do we repeat it all the time without having to look for new firewood, reloading the fuel, digging new oil wells, uh, <clears throat> refining gasoline, all that stuff. How do we get around that and be more like you anyway? Because hydrogen's got this stuff on demand. As soon as it blows it out, it can reload. Just put it out in the sun. So that's what we want to try to do here. So I'm comparing a rocket to, you know, at the time I said, well, just put one of these light pumping things on the, uh, you know, everyone's seen this model, right? The Star Trek Enterprise. That's been around since I was a kid, a long time. So, um, you know, may, may, I'm trying to make these people think like, man, maybe that's what they do. Maybe that's what they do. Pump this light. Uh, and, you know, of course, on the TV show and the movies, they don't. They do some hand-waving nonsense. And... Um, Call it something else. And uh, all I'm trying to do here is show, show people that, uh, hey, you don't, need to, you don't need a hand wave. Maybe someday you can do warp drive, but right now you got to, you know, don't try to skip steps. And that's what I see the caveman doing here. Well, he's not doing it. He's following nature step by step correctly. As... Uh, as the rocket became the natural outgrowth of that, which is a good thing. But we can consider the pumping model, like this Virginia-class submarine. Well, what the hell is that, Kelly? Well, that's the most advanced kind of submarine there is, the nuclear power, the state-of-the-art. See, whoever designed this knows that they're not sailing. They're pump. They're in an ocean, not on it. So forget that. Uh, sailing uh, stuff. It's pumping what it's in, which is the which is water. Well, if you're out in space, or even if you're down here on Earth, you're sitting in a pool of light. Yeah, down here it's got air in it. It's got water. Out in space, it's just pure light, though. You know, so that's your really your better model, and that's where you're ultimately trying to go. Down here, you're just in the atmosphere, and water's part of the atmosphere, too. But, you know, if you look at it from the big picture, which you should. So, that's what you want to... Your medium is light, okay? Bottom line, do that first, then maybe you can reach out and grab plank lengths. Good luck with that. Those are smaller, then the universe is big. The logic there escapes me for now. Other people can see it with... Equations and things, I you know, okay, I'll take your word for it that, it, you know, there's a little rounding error there, maybe. So this, this 
thing was designed to go to people, rocket types. This was before I heard of UFO Twitter. I don't think it was around. I don't know. Um, so I'm trying to convince rocket people in those days, which was not uh, uh, not very convincing in some some forums. Anyway, so I say, okay, well, you know, reload the fuel. And down here is a little graphic. Why do we need these guys? A dinosaur holding a, a fuel pump, all right? That's, and here's the oxygen factory that looks like it's from the Industrial Revolution. And I'm saying you do it my way, you cut out the middleman. You be transparent to gravity. Yeah, that's what I was calling it. Gravity transparency was a, Another buzzword. And this happy alien here saying, approach the speed of light. Why wait? Get yours today. And, uh, you know, he's blowing off rockets left and right. So that'll speak for itself. So continuing the next tweet. Here I am saying, again saying you're pumping the medium. You're not exploding your way through it spurt by spurt you're continuously pulling it so at we dot 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 at which point the fuel once considered energy is effectively the storage mechanism itself for very short term photon storage to wit a pump and there's a little squid there's a state of the art warfighter and you know I think uh, I think nature shows us, and our seafaring, under seafaring shows us ultimately where you're going. Now that needs power. Yes, it needs power to pull the pump. In um, in light pumping, the power the pumps are built in, picks you know, angstrom by angstrom on the skin, pulling it right through the skin. This has a big pump, and yeah, so they might need some power, but it. It's not fuel, it's not massive amounts, it's just enough to control the pumps. Turn them on, turn them off. Now in here you've got a big nuclear powered uh, pump which works fine for now. So let's go with that. Continuing I say, or you can just think of it reloading for more combustion along the lines of your tweet above. In other words, his tweet had a, has a glimmer of intuition to it. He's looking for this shortcut, and I'm telling him what it is because I went through the same thought process. At that campfire in Georgia, I'm rollerblading. It's cold. It's winter time there, which is not that cold. Um, come up to the campfire. I could feel the warmth, the heat, the radiation pressure. Right while I'm trying to figure out uh, the relationship between propulsion and buoyancy, and it helped. And I'm saying to him that you are thinking on the right track. Although in his instant, his example, that's an inefficient uh, way to do it. It's it costs more in energy to reload that way but it's the right idea it's the right principle once you got the principle then you can look for easier ways to do it so that's what we're doing here uh continuing speaking back to chris leto continuing the atoms plasma or molecules involved are pumping photons pumping light but the baby need not be thrown out with the bathwater. <clears throat> In parentheses, this will lead to the hard stuff, pure wave guides eventually, but that's for later. That's which, you know, it is for later, but a wave guide is just capturing, it's not absorbing the light, it's just filtering it basically. It still has that explosive quality, especially if you use this, the, the sub wavelength waveguides uh, so we don't, we're not going there today necessarily but um, ultimately we're doing the same thing but I think you first have to learn how to do it walk before you run 
etc. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, yeah, the old saying, the canard, the baby in the bathwater, that's what he's thinking, he's right. You can still call it energy storage when you shut it off if you must. This is just from trying to now drag the last few propulsion types, Newtonians, across the finish line here. But it'll typically run starting at 10 to the 15 zeros behind it per second, ultimately approaching the speed of light itself. In other words, if you shut it off, it's going to have some, uh, you know, photons stored in it. So temporarily, it's rocket-like. Um... Considerable, if not ultimate, photonic energy densities are the goal here, too, by the way. In other words, this metamaterial is going to be a lot more absorbent than, uh, you know, we just don't think that way right now. But the, the, uh, that's been co that'll be covered. Uh, I mean, there's some kind of animal fighting outside, I guess. Something's going on out there. Anyway. I live in the woods, and uh, you see some amusing stuff here. And there was a fox hanging around here this morning. I don't know, you know. Anyway, that's weird. They usually don't run by this window that I'm facing. Sorry. Uh, so where are we? Uh, photonic energy densities. Yeah, we'll get into that a little bit more. Because they're, they're talking about zeros behind zeros behind zeros times zeros per square area, per unit. And then you throw time onto it. These rockets blow it out once, all right? I'm blowing it out here. I'm proposing it here. 10 to the 15 zeros behind it times per second. Oh, yeah, there's a, there's a fox and a dog out there getting into it or something. That's weird. Matter of fact, I'm going to take a break for a minute and see what's going on here. So I'm going to control pause and be right back. First, I've got to get my camera out. Wow. All right, enough of that. It's like Skinwalker Ranch around here. I think I look like a German Shepherd. And I guess the other one was the Fox. There's two foxes around here, too. I, I don't know what I saw. It's like... Anyway, they don't... It, that doesn't happen here. And there's no loose dogs, either. But it looked like a big dog. <laughs> anyway. They're probably just playing back there. But that was bizarre. So, uh... uh I, I apologize for that interruption. Um... Okay, we were talking about the folk, yeah, the, the quadrillion quadrillions and the octo seconds. That stuff adds up, and uh, that's it's not that's not hand waving. That's how nature acts. You have to capture that. So it's not quite like this with a little surfer emoji, but it'll feel like it combined with a jet ski. Only far smoother. Uh, you know, it just hit me. I was imagining right then. And I, he's a surfer. That's why he lives in southern Portugal where the gigantic waves are. And I used to be a lifeguard on Surfer's Beach in uh, Maryland. And uh, I don't know. I never was one because I was always working. And my day off was not on the beach. But, uh, so I'm kind of fascinated by it. It's the only sport I watch on TV. And I like the rollerblade, and that's similar. Anyway, I thought I'd try to catch his attention with the surfing. But that's ultimately, it's similar. What we're talking about is similar. You could say, well, you're catching the light waves. Yeah, you are. If you do it right, you're catching it with a waveguide and or an atom or a molecular or something like, you know, something else you're using to uh, capture and move the light, and you're riding along with it. So I say quadrillions of tiny pumps storing and releasing 
photon, quintillions of times per second, well beyond normal perception, absorbing and emitting repeatedly, continuously, pumping in silence. No wonder they are eerie. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, uh, you know, it's going to look strange. And I've never seen anything. I can just imagine what it, what it could be like. Uh, all the numbers are there. Nature works a certain way. But you have to capture it. You have to, you know, and that takes effort. And this, um, in this tweet, is a, uh, a link to a YouTube, another of my YouTubes. You can look at it. It describes uh, I, this gigantic photon going into this tiny thing. And that doesn't do it justice because that should be 6,500 times bigger. But there's not enough room, there's not enough pixels on a screen, so uh, I'm just trying to give people a perspective on it, and myself. I do these things for my own thought process as well. And if you look at that, it will also show, like, well, this is like a surface, a metamaterial surface, and it will show, well, like, what about the air? The air is not a, not a uh, factor here, or, nor is water. Because those molecules are so, are bigger than this surface. This surface is tight, angstrom by angstrom. And this light here is blowing that away, or it's whirlpooling in so fast. No molecules want to be near it, don't need to be around it. They're not crowding the playing field here. So if you get the light kind, you're controlling it which way it comes in, which way it's going. You're blowing it around yourself in a bubble. Uh, so you're, you're pushing away the air. The air is not interested in being there because it's a light zone. Uh, it's either pushed away or it's just, uh, it's just not going to fall in the whirlpool. It's not interested. You have to see it in nature, uh, this whirlpool uh, effect I'm talking about, to see... Uh, you know, if a thing's too big, it's not going to fit in there. It doesn't care. Anyway, look at that video. And I shout out to Radiant Flux Per Mass Density. That's your new uh, rocket equation. Round it off. This is where engineering around the general principle comes in. How best to do it while doing it best. Motivational poster. Because the idea is as basic as your similar proposition above. Trying to tell them you're on the right track. Ambient light, like visible and infrared, and everything else can be used for this. There's the sun, there's the spectrum rainbow. Nothing exotic is needed to get started. Just things like hydrogen atoms available from wood in any nearby tree. What I'm talking about you see in nature. This is what buoyancy is. This is why things float. They are moving light in, through, out, and around themselves, artificially or naturally. A campfire that never goes out. Well, there's your little flying saucer emoji, uh, which is moving, you know, in my estimation, moving light in, through, out, and around. And if they're not doing it, some of them are doing it. Human beings could be doing it, but first they got to get a clue on the general principle, and I'm giving it to them, and I'm not going to stop. I'm only going to get louder and more frequent um, as my time gets freer and freer, which it is as I'm moving into retirement and getting, it, getting it, everything in place, where I can do this every day, all day. Not that I'm going to do it all day, but... Anyway, archetypes abound. There's a, here's heavier than air water in an air in a water cloud that defined gravity. It used to be ice. It used to be liquid on the ground. Why is it in the air? Well, it's a gas now. It's steam. Why is it that? It's because of, of light passing through it. That stuff automatically pumps light. That's why we capture it or copy it. This butterfly has waveguides. That's more advanced. 
<clears throat> that helps them float. It helps them be hydrophobic. It reduces drag. Uh, this little flying saucer, that's, we addressed that. It's copying this balloon. Believe me. Capture an alien and ask them that. If, even if a rocket relands in reverse like SpaceX, even a rocket that relands in reverse, which he's talking about reverse on his campfire, could be shoehorned in there. In other words, I'm saying I'll allow it with this common meme. I don't know what TV show that is, but I think it's a TV show. Anyway, I'll allow it because when I was going through this, like the reloading fuel and the floating and all this, I thought a rocket could do that. Probably if it was engineered correctly. Well, guess what? The guy came along and did it. Um, that's what we're going to do, except we're going to be reloading the fuel mid-flight um, from the ambient medium. So sh congratulations to them. Uh, I'm not, you know, I bash rockets, but that's only to get attention mainly. I mean, um, let's be honest about it. Everyone likes them. I'd like to go see one see one land like that someday. Anyway, so the way we're thinking in the original question is highly logical and practical, in my opinion. That example is an energy efficient, but you have the right idea. You are onto something in a general sense. Capturing, exploiting, and recapturing photons, but quickly, is precisely the kind of things metamaterials are for. There's a tree, there's a log to burn, there's an atom. Hmm, how do those tie together? Well, let's continue on our caveman journey into the future. And I linked the tall terahertz tail thing there because that tells the story of how the flying saucers may or may not tie into metamaterials and what are they for and how does it work and all that stuff. And continuing on a similar, on the same thing. That's why purportedly busted terahertz waveguides are literally falling from the sky around here. If the Drake equation is right, that is to be expected. Yeah. If there's aliens all over the place, some of them are doing what I'm telling you to do now. Not all of them, but the ones that might be interested in us, because one of us morons is going to figure it out. And I'm just the guy to do it. And I think it's right, anyway. So, uh, continuing. They're not exactly... Speaking of the aliens, they're not exactly reversing combustion, but it's the same idea carried farther, optimized. And there's an alien with a little recycling uh, thing there because, you know, they're done with the smoky, exploding, dangerous rockets and on to more dangerous stuff. So, so will we be, I suppose. Continuing, I say, lather, rinse, repeat, just like paint, planting more firewood but hella faster, mega, ultra, hella faster, speed of light stuff. And there's my uh, metamaterials propaganda. Most of you have seen that before. If not, it's linked below. There's a Twitter moment. There's a video that goes into this. Now this might be the quotable shot of the, of the video. I don't know. I, it might cause a cognitive breakthrough for some of you. It kind of did for me, because when, sometimes when you say to yourself, well, when you put it that way, that's a good way to put it. Anyway, this video describes, among other things, the proposed use of graphene, hydrogenated graphene, hydrogenated graphene, which is literally a reloadable hydrocarbon. A reloadable hydrocarbon. What do we use for energy in this world? Rockets, just about everything. We use hydrocarbons. 
We even eat carbohydrates. Why? Because there's all that stored energy in there. That's why. What if you could reload it all the time instead of, you know, fooling around with fuel? The fuel, the fuel reloads itself. And it, now the fuel is merely a storage and pumping mechanism. It holds it and or releases it. If it does it fast, you can call it a pump. If it does it slowly, you know, that's your definition, my definition. What's slowly? I don't know. How long's coal been in the ground? A long time. All right? But it's, uh, you can release it and it's useful. Uh, so, I'm saying reload that fuel in real time. The active ingredient is the photon. Let's uh, move toward working on that. And you'll be better off. And your gasoline bill will be lower. And your heating bill will be lower. Just to start on today, how would that impact you? Things like that would be changing cold to a portable cozy campfire in a few years too. Yeah, instant heat in a can. You watch with graphene and graphene and whatnot. You'll be going camping. You'll pull out a pull out a little can of a campfire. It's just as warm as a wood campfire without all the work. And you get to save the trees, like this tree here. This one's in the backyard. Probably where the, the foxes like to fight under that one too, or whatever's going on back there. Anyway, it looks like the Wizard of Oz tree, so I threw that one in there just for visual uh, change. And winding down here finally on this, there's a little more after this uh, moment. I say, so let's leave them behind to combust more. Let's leave them be and combust more effectively, leave the trees alone by copying nature. But other parts of nature, the hydrogen. As you can see, your tweet provoke. Oh, okay, winding up with Chris. This is like tweet 27. He's probably got me muted by now. As you can see, your tweet provoked a few brain cells regarding UAP, the UAP, issue at hand here on UFO Twitter. Uh, that's a group of people that blather about this stuff all the time. Different aspects. I'm on one aspect. He's in the same corner sometimes. He's all over it. I'm only on nuts and bolts mostly. That's what good questions do. So he asked a good question about the fire. Uh, you know, I don't know how much time he spends in a rabbit hole on that or if that was just a throwaway tweet. Anyway, I'll see myself out. Probably muted. <laughs> anyway, so that's uh, what kicked off this video. And when I was thinking about making it, I decided, you know, I saw a few other things that were kind of related. So I'm going to mention them. I guess a tweet came along. Uh, somebody said something about negative mass. The UFO bot, which is a funny account. Uh, but sometimes serious, like mentioning negative mass for some reason. So that's kind of what we're talking about here with propulsion or with uh, combustion propulsion and even light pumping because it's losing, like a combustion loses mass and mass equivalent. But the mass equivalent is driving it. And it's ultimately more important because if you lost mass, slowly it wouldn't matter. But now you're, here I'm getting into a gray area. Uh, I don't want to go there completely yet. I call that mass that rocket throws out a rounding error. But uh, this isn't about that. I have to get into that deeper before I talk about it too much. Although I think it's right. I'm sure it is. Because who cares about it? Ultimately. So, back to the negative mass. What am I saying here? Negative mass equivalent is so nice, but negative mass equivalent is much easier. Yes, negative mass is a thing in, in physics that people, it's like, 
it's a concept that would be nice to have, but, you know, it's on the fringe of anti this and that. And I'm saying if, you if you're losing mass equivalent sufficiently in time, over time, compared to the acceleration of the local gravity, you effectively have a, uh, a negative mass. That's why a rocket goes up in the air, because it's acting like this so-called negative mass. Same with a balloon. Why is it going up? Does it have no mass? No, it has mass. It's just being the equivalent of that mass and more is being removed in the form of mass equivalent, which is light, which is photon, which is Albert Einstein's uh, big idea, and you're gonna argue with him now. Most most of this stuff I'm talking about, you can question a tinfoil hat. I'm just gonna throw you on to somebody else that uh, you don't think you can question. At, well, you know, at some point. But it's just not recognized for what it is. Things float for a reason. There's the cloud again, there's the balloon, there's the hypothetical, theoretical flying saucer emoji. I say that's what they're doing, most of them. And we should and could do and can do and all that. You've heard that. And I said that in response to a tweet by alien scientist. Oh, okay, I quoted myself twice or something. Because, and uh, <clears throat> I'll just read what I said to alien scientist. It's not so much negative mass as losing sufficient mass or mass equivalent quicker than a local acceleration of gravity. Okay, I just said that. And what is mass equivalent but far less affected by gravity? Light, including terahertz. So that's why you wrap yourself around in it. Not only are you thrusting you know, repeated propulsion and or you call it thrusting. You can call it momentum release or capture and release. Um, but then with that, in addition to that, and this is where the physicist and the math, I don't see it out there. I don't see people thinking about it, talking about it. I can't find it. Maybe a, there's a field there uh, where they do that. I, I, I know there is somewhere. There's got to be. Anyway, I'll, I'll give them the word problem. They can go ahead and figure it out yourself. Because you're going to, in addition to that propulsiveness and I just mentioned, you're throwing it out around yourself. You're not blasting it out like a rocket. You're wrapping yourself around. You're wrapping it around yourself, reusing it, and creating an area there, a bubble of light. Now that that's going to be less, vastly less affected by gravity. So if your mass is in a thing that's it's stuck in there, you're controlling it, but you're effectively entangled. And I don't mean it in that voodoo way they they use, which. It's not voodoo, it's just the uh, quantum physics way. I'm using it in the normal sense of the word. Entangled, it's wrapped up in it. And meshed is a word uh, that might be better. Uh, you're in a field. You're creating a field that isn't bothered by gravity. It is a little bit. Because it's light, it is a little bit. But it basically isn't. So you're transforming your environment. Um, now, we don't do that really in any way that I can think of except maybe cavitation around a submarine. They're thinking about doing that with hypersonics and it's top secret this and that. We'll do it and keep doing it. And you'll realize that you got to keep, you know, the more you do it, suddenly, magically, there's extra lift. There's less drag. Why is that? I don't know. Because, you're, because of why I already said. Plus, you're add, and if you, you t take that effect and you add that continuous propulsion that, you know, you, again, you're blowing out your fuel once to my 10 to the 15 times a second. 
Okay, you got a little mass there on your once. What? Uh, hydrogen, oxygen. Okay, that's going to make a difference. Uh, but is it, you know, in the long run, my 10 to the 15 plus plus uh, photons per second are going to out outclass that. Plus, I'm using them. I'm I'm, I'm aiming them better. I'm uh, what's that? Thrust vectoring into a bubble. It isn't even bothered by gravity. Sooner or later, I'm blowing your doors off over uh, Cal uh, Catalina Island. So that's how that works. Oh, speaking of Tic Tacs, there's a, for some reason, oh, okay, all right, this one. I'm off that, th that other thread. So I don't have to read every tweet. I'm winding down here. I see the light at the end of the tunnel. And here's a gratuitous butterfly thing, which we mentioned before. They know how to float. They're not combusting necessarily, but they are pulling through, in, through, out, and around. That's why I don't have to flap as much. That's just my theory. That's just my opinion. Same with a lot of these, these other things in nature that are intelligently using light more than the shaved ape. Um, this is all. This is mostly butterflies. Moths do the same thing. There's a hummingbird. They do it to an extent. They're like a hybrid, almost of a of a butterfly, almost. Now they flap a lot, as you know. A butterfly is a very low flapper. That's why people are so confused about how does it stay. How does it? Yeah, it also drops, zigzags, goes up and down, does a lot of things. Look carefully. Um, and the hummingbird, what else do I have? It's some, a couple other bugs of note. Pardon me, these birds, <clears throat> they take advantage of uh, iridescence. That's going to reduce their drag. It's going to give them some hydrophobia, phobic uh, surfaces on them. Uh, they're not UFOs, they are real, uh, but they use some advantages. I like that little drawing there. Um, they, they take advantage of what's there. Look at that metamaterial on that bird. All right, that's what you want your next, beyond next generation propulsion to start looking like that instead of exploding fuel tanks. Uh, I did a whole, uh, there's a moment on that link below. There's a video on it. There's a beetle. These are bees falling out of the, shut down. There are bees in there, hundreds of bees. Turns out the light, they fall down. You tell me why. Okay. So we'll do that later. We're done with this. There's a moth. That just got in there somehow. How that got in there with campfires when you start questioning, am I a tinfoil hat? I don't know. So let's, let's have a shout out here to SpaceX. Now, I'm citing fair use because this is their ad. They put this out there. This is a, I'm not copying this. I'd like to blow it up the full screen, but uh, I don't want a copyright strike. But let's look at it. This is cool. It's linked below where you can find it yourself. This is filmed from where the rocket lands. It's looking straight ahead. Oh, there's, there's the blast off. There's the rocket coming right at you. Coming right at you. And it's going to throw itself in reverse. That's a, com that's a combusting thing uh, that's not running, you know, that's, that's being intelligently designed to lose its mass equivalent. Rate of loss of mass equivalence and mass, to be fair, intelligently to break its fall. That's how these things, you know, I saw a flying saucer go up and down and land. Well, you're seeing one here in the making. It's got dumb fuel because it runs out. If it could refuel up there or anywhere, um... With the ambient environment, there's plenty of photons in the night air. 
It looks like a nice warm Florida night. There's some visible there. There's all kinds of stuff there. You could make a meta surface absorb in, out, through, and around. All right. Very good for them. And winding down a little further. Oh, yeah. Speaking of tinfoil hats, here's the father of... Here's me, uh... All right, this is another tweet. It set me off. Professor Brian Keating, astronomer, I think astrophysicist, physicist, professor. I, I Forgive me if I overstepped. Uh, but well-respected in this general area. Open-minded, anyway. He, uh, said a t he has a tweet here saying, you know, being a wise guy, but... He's thinking like Chris, Leto, kind of like me, along the thought of, what are we really looking at here? What's what? He says, we should rename nuclear power steam power because that's actually what's generating electricity. True, kind of. I worked in nuclear plants, engineering, construction, testing, and then later even on legal uh, Matter. So I know a little bit about it. It's been a long time. I went into something else after that because nuclear power in this country uh, ceased uh, building new plants. But that's another beef. Anyway, yeah, the heat there comes out. It's not combustion exactly. It's the nuclear reaction where photons are released. And they cause good things to happen. It's stored in there. And it causes water to get hot. And that's what's generating electricity. Yeah, it goes through the, the you know, the boiling water and steam go through the uh, main steam supply system, the MSSSSS, NS, nuclear steam. Anyway, that's a long time ago. That's another job. And it's, the steam spins a turbine. The turbine has magnets on it, which... Uh, coils and magnets, you know, wrapped around each other, uh, cause them, cause the electrical uh, field uh, to, well, cause the uh, electricity to move, and the right hand rule and all that. So, I saw that he set me off like Chris did, and I'm saying to him, it makes one wonder if the motive power of fire and the quote full of heat—that's an old expression as well as their opposite effects, can be extended to light in general and exploited. This is me trying to sell him, who he may recognize as a crackpot on Twitter, that this guy was one just a few hundred years ago, okay? Well beyond the cave days. We come up to start thinking about, is heat useful? For what? Well, he turns out this quack is now the described as the father of thermodynamics. Uh, I guess it's Sadi Carnot. We all know, a lot of us hear about the Carnot cycle. You have to learn that in engineering school and things like that. Especially if you're a mechanical engineer, which I am not, but I had, had to... You know, you take introductory courses and stuff, so you know what the other ones are doing. And you learn about him. So, look him up. See what his journey was like. Trying to convince people that heat is uh, the real thing. It's not the water or whatever it is. It's not the hot water. You know, it's... Well, read it. I don't want to butcher that history. Uh, but yeah, I'm kind of comparing uh, what I'm trying to say to what he was trying to say. Because I believe, like him, I will ultimately be proven right. And it'll be like so obvious. And geez, everybody has a nuclear power plant in their backyard. Two, you know, moving from that to, uh, you know, these flying saucers and this anti gravity air quotes ironic font, whatever you want to call it, it's going to act like that. 
Um, so that's my point, and thank you for listening today. I think I'm done. I'm going to shut off. I'm going to pause at one hour. Oh, that's good timing, too. I thought it was blowharding harder. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to... I'm going to say good night and play some outro music. Where am I? Where's me only? There's me only in the dark. The sun went down. Can you see uh can you see any scenery there? Night in November. Anyway. All right, that's that's for me to look at years from now later. I remember that night. That was the day the foxes had a fight. So, now, let us pause again and have the outro. Control P.